seems to be self-evident. That all men are created. As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast for insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I'm going to talk to you today about one of my favorite topics, which is, I think, rational environmentalism. Uh, Republicans really need to, I think, come to the table on this and lean in because our ideas are correct. And the conversation about climate change isn't really a debate over whether it's happening or not. It's a debate about what you actually do about it. And agreeing on the premise of how bad it might be, what the costs are actually um, regarding climate change, and then what the solutions might be that that actually make the most sense. Um, got a lot of, we've already had some great guests on this topic, but today I'm really excited. Um, coming from Denmark or Sweden, Dr. Bjorn Lomborg, thank you so much for being on the show. Hey, Dan, it's great to be here. So um, I'll read your biography really quick for everybody. You're the president of the Copenhagen Consensus Center, or visiting professor at Copenhagen Business School. Copenhagen Consensus Center, it's a think tank that researches the smartest ways to do good. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, you were named Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World. Uh, some of your books include The Skeptical Environmentalist, Cool It, and How to Spend $75 Billion to Make the World a Better Place. Um, Oh, and the Nobel Laureate's Guide to Smartest Targets for the World 2016 to 2030 and Prioritizing Development, a Cost-Benefit Analysis of the UN's SDGs. What are SDGs? Sustainable Development Goals. Okay. All right. Sounds like a, I come from the military, so I was like, is that a, uh, a small destroyer group? You know, it's like it's <laughs> sort of uh, acronyms that look familiar to me. Um, again, really appreciate you being on. Are you in Copenhagen right now? No, I'm I'm actually in southern Sweden. And why are you in in southern Sweden? Yeah. It's because they have a better so, coronavirus policy, or what's going on? Well, p- p- partly that, but yeah, uh, mostly I um, I used to live in Denmark, uh, but uh, when we had a change of government, the uh, the incoming government actually ran on a promise to cut off my funding. So you know, we're going to improve the Danish economy. We're going to get more people employed. We're going to get rid of Bjorn. And, you know, uh, <laughs> and so you and, you're, and, you're that important, <laughs> like you're that well, big of a well, deal in I, Denmark, where they wanted to get I, rid I, of you. I, I, I think it more shows how incredibly unhealthy the conversation is in, in, in terms of, you know, there's an order of magnitude or several orders of magnitude in, between those uh, different things. Uh, but yes, a lot of people are very uh, annoyed about uh, a lot of the points that I try to make. And, and I understand why, because I'm, I'm simply insisting we got to have good data and we got to do what's smart, not just what feels good. Uh, but anyway, so uh, they cut off my funding. So I moved to uh, uh, Prague uh, after that. But, um, but uh, when the corona came around, my boyfriend lives in sweden so we had to make up uh, a, a sort of call do we want to stay in um in, uh, in in prague or in southern sweden and southern sweden was certainly a nicer place to stay okay okay can we can we talk about that for a second just i don't know it's not like what we're supposed to be talking about <laughs> sure. um but i'm just you know because it is the the age of the pandemic and sweden is this sort of outlier in coronavirus policy so mm-hmm. what was that like living through it you guys think sweden made the right decision at this point Well, it's hard to tell, uh, Dan. So uh, very clearly, there is a lot of benefits to the uh, to the Swedish policy. I've been arguing uh, that it's probably the right one because it's the only one that's sustainable for a long period of time. Uh, Basically, they made sure that everyone uh, social distance. Uh, They did what every uh, 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 infectious disease expert tell you to do, namely flatten the curve so you don't overwhelm the healthcare system. But they did not go to zero. Now, a lot of countries realize, oh, we can flatten the curve. Why don't we make it go to zero? And yeah. and there's some, you know, there's some sense to that. If if you it's can avoid thinking, any though. any any damage, you you sort of think you should do that. But of course, the point is, unless you're willing to keep that uh, lockdown essentially until uh, you get a cure or a uh, vaccine, 
you basically have to just simply see those deaths later on. And of course, that's right. what the, the the Swedish authorities are also arguing that you will probably delay. just see this later. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, and at the same time, of course, you've actually kept kids in school, which means they actually learn instead of being uh, a disadvantaged and also, you know, uh, going stir crazy at home. Uh, and yeah. you've kept the economy going. So I think the, the fundamental point is to recognize their costs to not dealing enough with corona but there's also cost to dealing if you will too much with corona and you need to weigh those two and in some sense i guess that's exactly what we're going to be talking about on climate we need to recognize that you can never do any policies without there also being disbenefits and you need to weigh the costs and the benefits it's yeah, really that's not a, that's actually very hard but you need to have that conversation yeah, it's actually a really great lead in. Um, that is correct. I mean, that that's been the conversation around COVID, and um, and I, I don't I don't think it's been a good conversation. I, I think Sweden seems to have had a good conversation about it. Um, here in America, I, I don't think we have. Um, I, I think that's the case in many countries uh, where I, I, it's almost as if people believe that there was this sort of binary choice, which is do everything, universal lockdowns, or do nothing, and mm. you know, and, and be and be. Uh, irresponsible. Of course, that's not true. Yeah. There's there's quite a bit of of steps in between, and you know, and, and say here in Texas, we're we're basically at that point now, where the steps in between are what we're doing. It's, it's the mask wearing, and you know, there's no big concerts, right? And and mm. bars can't, you know, there aren't aren't open, and they can't pack people in them. That's basically it. Um, that seems to have been a more sensible solution all along. Uh, but yeah, the, this this notion that you could ever flatten the curve down to zero was always utopian thinking especially because you can you, you can use some common sense and just understand how people interact with one another just because you shut down businesses and tell people to stay at home well they just go to each other's apartments and they just go to each other's houses and then this is this is how we saw um well, well part of you, how we saw spikes anyway yeah, you can possibly get them to do it for a month or two, which they managed to do in Spain, especially if, you know, in France, you you send the police after them. Uh, but it's unlikely you can make people do this for a year. And, and that's, of course, the real trouble, that you can feel like you're really fixing the problem in the short run, but you're not really in the long run. Uh, I actually, I, I have a metaphor that I think you'll love from from the book as well, uh, because it goes on on climate policy as well. Uh, if, if you think about it, in the US, every year, about 40,000 people die on the roads, you know, mostly from uh, traffic accidents. And right. we have the perfect technology to avoid all of those 40,000 deaths. It's just simply setting the speed limit at three miles an hour. Right. Nobody dies. But of course, you wouldn't have a continentally integrated economy. You wouldn't be able to go to see your parents or your friends. Uh, fundamentally, you don't have the conversation, should we go to three miles an hour or should we go to you know Germany and just let everyone drive as crazy as they want? You have a conversation about should it be you know, 55 miles an hour or 85 miles an hour? And that is a good and sensible conversation. But believing that you should go down to three miles an hour is typically a bad idea and it's the same right. thing with climate change and indeed with COVID. yeah i do like that analogy and so much that i've used it many times actually because <laughs> uh, it, it, it is it's a good analogy and it, what it, the other thing i would add to that analogy is listen we mitigate risk when we drive that's that's what we do we create mm -hmm. rules of the road and we mitigate risk to the best of our abilities but we don't seek to completely eliminate it and and, and again w w with things and, and it, it seems like we we do that kind of cost benefit analysis cost benefit analysis with some issues, some risk factors, but then with others, we almost develop like a religious adherence to a certain way. And mm. I think that seems to be the case with climate change um, and coronavirus, but okay, we're done talking about coronavirus. Um, let's talk about climate change. And so, I mean, is, is that, am I accurate in saying that? Is, is that why Denmark kicked you out? <laughs> is, it, is it because of the sort of religious <laughs> I, adherence to a specific set of wind and solar only solutions? There, there is certainly a sense in which uh, a lot of people have uh, uh, an understanding. There is only one right way to fix this. Uh, and, and of course, the, the point is that when people have this idea, uh, you know, you ask M Americans, for instance, uh, a vast majority will say global warming is really bad or it's even an existential crisis and we need to do something about it. And then you ask them, uh, how much are you willing to pay? Uh, Washington Post did that last year. And, you know, more than half of all 
but people were not willing to pay even $24 a year. And, and so there's this great disconnect. At one end, you say, we should do everything. But at the other end, of course, you're not actually willing to pay for it. And I think that's the real driver of the, of the disconnect in much of climate conversation. Everyone claims we're going to do everything. But yeah. when it actually comes to it, nobody's willing to pay that bill. And so much of this ends up just being, uh, you know, uh, virtue signaling, people telling, oh, I'm so good and I really care about the future, but only for $24 or less. Yeah, that, that is an interesting uh, study. And but the, the problem is, is people see their electricity prices go sky high like they did in yeah. Germany. And like we're now seeing in Cal. Well, we've been seeing it in California for quite a while, but now we're seeing rolling blackouts and it's I, I don't think people connect that to the the energy policies being implemented there um you know these sort of mini green new deals um in california and germany and these are not successful stories <laughs> no but I, I think people are increasingly seeing that this is only going to go one way as we are promising more and more uh uh, uh 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 taxes to fix climate change uh you know so yeah. so the yellow vests if you, uh, uh we might mm, still remember yeah. those in france from yeah. uh 2018 19 uh when uh the president macron wanted to increase the price of gasoline uh about 13 cents per gallon uh 13 cents that's you know it's not nothing but it's certainly not a huge amount and yeah. basically france erupted uh, and yeah, and if you're enough. actually going to yeah. fix, if you're going to fix climate change, we're talking uh, uh, in the in the way that many argue, uh, we're talking many dollars, possibly even tens of dollars of taxes on your on a gallon of gasoline, and across all areas, and for all countries, not just for rich Americans, but also for China and India and Africa, and that's just you know implausible by any sense. And and, and you know the question I always want to get to and answer for people is what are you really accomplishing? So hmm. let, let's say we do have all the money in the world. Like, let, let's just imagine that scenario, all the money in the world to spend on this problem. And, and we, you know, we reduce emissions by, I don't know, the, you know, the targets set by the Paris Climate Agreement, you know, and, and the, the, which we assume reduces the, the increase in temperature by a, by a given amount. You'd probably know the numbers. I don't off the top hmm. of my head. The real question is, what happens then? What benefits do we even derive from that? Are we actually stopping sea level rises in a massive way? Are we actually, mm -hmm. are we actually preventing the sort of superstorms that we like to imagine um, in the movies? Uh, you know, yeah. what are we, what are we actually preventing? That, that's an important question. That that and gets to the we often the, don't ask. Yeah. No, and it, and it gets to the premise of the problem. Like, I think for too long. At least in America, like you know, we kind of there was an argument between whether it's even happening or whether it's man-made or any of that, right? So mm -hmm. let's agree with the premise that, of course, mankind and CO two emissions have some effect on the climate. Let's just agree with that premise. The question is how much and and what is what is a reason what what reasonably if you stopped emitting, what would actually happen? Yeah. So Dan, just right off the bat, I mean, I'm I'm a social scientist. I work with a lot of economists, some uh, you know, seven Nobel laureates, hundreds of the world's top economists uh, on a variety of different areas. So we look at the cost and benefits, not on the science. So I simply accept the science, accept what the UN Climate Panel is telling us. Now, you you ask something that any economist will inevitably end up answering wrong. If you say you have all the money in the world, of course we'd fix global warming entirely and we'd fix every other problem in the world. So I'd, I'd mm. rather just go with saying uh, with with any realistically optimistic outcome that we actually achieved the Paris Agreement. It mm -hmm. would cost us one to two trillion dollars a year for the world. That's a lot of money. It's not the, you know, going to the poorhouse kind of money. It's one to two percent of, of the world's GDP. It's a lot of money. We could afford it, but certainly we could also spend that money on, on a lot of other things. But mm -hmm. the impact, even in a hundred years after spending, you know, sixty to one hundred and twenty trillion dollars, would be almost impossible to measure. So we estimate the total impact would probably be on the order of reducing temperatures by the end of the century, zero point three degrees Fahrenheit. So that's no, not a good. That's not a good outcome. <laughs> no, no, it's not. <laughs> and and what this tells you is that we're simply barking up the wrong tree, or we're, we're trying a solution that we've honestly been trying for 30 years. And we know we have failed for 30 years, but even if we succeeded, 
we wouldn't do very much. We would just spend lots of resources and achieve very little. You mentioned, for instance, well, is it going to avoid these, you know, uh, these Hollywood superstorms? First of all, let's just get real with this. We don't actually see a signal right now. Uh, if anything, you know, the U.S. has actually seen declining numbers of both hurricanes and strong hurricanes landfalling on the U.S. continental, continental U.S. Uh, since 1900. But we estimate because of global warming, we'll see slightly fewer hurricanes, which is good, but slightly stronger hurricanes, which is bad. Overall, it turns out that it's more bad than it's good. So we'll see larger damages. But what you also have to remember is you are also going to see less damages because you get richer. When you're richer, when you're less poor, you are much more resilient. So what we actually know is, and we have these numbers globally, right now, hurricanes globally cost 0.04% of GDP every year. With out global warming by the end of the century, because we were much richer, we, it would cost 0.01%, not 0.04%. So that's a dramatic decline. But because global warming will make hurricanes stronger, it will actually be 0.02%. Now, there's a point to this. First of all, global warming actually has a cost, but it's a very tiny cost. And remember, it's not that hurricanes are going to get much, much worse. It is that hurricanes are not going to get less bad as fast as they otherwise would have gotten. Mm -hmm. And that's an important point. You're talking about 0.01% difference in GDP. We will not be able to measure that even by the end of the century. We will be able to measure the fact that we're spending one to two, and many people are talking about much higher costs a percent every year because we're trying to do something about it. So the reality is we would end up spending lots of resources doing only very little good. That's a bad use of resources. Yeah, and the other fatal flaw I see in the in the reasoning on on the on the climate change activists on this, and I'm trying to explain this, what's in my head cor correctly here, is they 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 would point out that if if only we had taken action and, and done all of this, then it, it's it, it's almost like they they're they're trying to sell this idea that all of our weather would look like San Diego, California, forever. And of course, that's not true. And, and they're going to, and we know just based on their rhetoric over the past few decades that the goalposts are always going to be moving, right? So it's like even if if we took some if we took some action, and our models suggested that it got it got worse less fast than it otherwise would have, the the argument will still be that it's that it's not enough, and and we've killed people by by not doing enough, right? And it's it's a, it's an unfalsifiable argument. Which is which is a, a logical inconsistency in and of itself. Well, it, I, I think it's more a question of saying they they say if you see the weather change, you will have net negative outcomes. That's probably true in the sense of Boston and uh, Miami have very different weather, but both of them are built to the weather that they have. So if the weather right. changes, if the temperature goes up, it'll be bath both in Boston and in Miami, because they both have to adapt away from what they historically have had. But the question, of course, is how bad is it going to be? And where, where uh, I think a lot of these people fail is to recognize that to many in Boston, having warmer weather is actually going to be good, mostly because heat kills much, much fewer people than cold generally. This is true almost globally, and this is certainly right. true in the U.S. Uh, so for every uh, 16 cold deaths, you only have one heat death. And so well, for very many in the short run, it's actually going to be a net benefit just when you look in cold and heat deaths. The yeah. simple point is that most people in Boston don't go to Nova Scotia for a vacation. They go to Miami. Uh, now, Miami might actually like to keep the weather wh where it is. But again, trying to stop the entire global economy to achieve a tiny uh, temperature reduction is possibly not the most effective way forward. Right, a tiny temperature reduction with really unknown benefits. And I think that's the, the key point here. And I would point my listeners to a, one of the first podcasts we did with Oren Cass, where he did a great um, study on on the costs of climate change. And, and what the studies always suggests is these these multi-billion dollar numbers and you're like well where does that come from and he, and he looked at it and they almost entirely come from deaths right so there's mm -hmm. there's a there's a statistical value that economists put on a human life and um 
And so you add that up and, and then they, they come up with a bigger number. But the thing is, is when you, when you actually pick apart how they analyzed this, this would have to be true, right? Like, so Philadelphia, let's say in a hundred years would be as warm as Houston. Okay. But their models would suggest, according to, to, the, to, to these studies, that Philadelphia's heat deaths would all of a sudden would increase by like huge orders of magnitude, hundreds and hundreds of people, which is nonsense. Because I mean, if, if we obviously, if we don't have those heat deaths in Houston, why on earth would we have them in, in Philadelphia? And so it, it just yep. assumes that there's zero behavioral change whatsoever. It assumes that people, um, you know, somehow forgot what air conditioning is and forgot to stay indoors. Yep. I mean, it's a very strange analysis and, 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 and you know, a simple logical exercise just, just debunks the entire thing. What, what else? Um, because I want to stick to the premise for a little bit before we get to the solutions that, you know, and the cost of benefits for solutions. Like, so we talked about hurricanes. Um, what, what about what about flooding and and fires and do, do you have you mm. looked at that? I mean, like, oh yeah, what is real and what isn't? Well, so again, uh, there's a lot of of, of uh, hype around this whole conversation, uh, and as you mentioned, a lot of times what is left out, just like you pointed out, that the models very often assume people won't buy air conditioners. Uh, and then they say, so people are going to die in droves, which seems odd if air conditioners is at, for sale. Uh, you know, people will actually be smart, uh, certainly over the next 80 years. When you look at flooding, you see the same thing. So last year, there was a big study uh, that got headlines in Washington Post and around the country uh, telling us that uh, because of global warming, sea levels would rise, which is absolutely true. And that will cause 187 million people having to relocate. Uh, over the next 80 years. Uh, and, and some publications, Rolling uh, Stones, for instance, went further and said 187 million people were going to drown. Uh, but what it means, of course, is that they're assuming that nobody does anything. So you sit on your beach and you watch the waves lap up over your knees and then eventually your hips and eventually you drown or have to move. But of course, the reality is we actually adapt. And that very same study that gave the 187 million people also said it was unrealistic and with realistic adaptation, that is more people building more sea defenses, you would not see 187 million people having to move. You'd have to see 305,000 people. So 600 times less. Remember 305,000 people having to relocate over the next 80 years. That's half the number of people that move out of California every year. I think the world can handle that. And it tells you what's the difference between when you're taught uh, a, a, a number that's insanely large and one that is fairly small and certainly manageable. The difference is between panic and alarm and just simply sensible. Yeah, that's a problem. We'll fix it. Yeah, a, a simple adaptation. I mean, the sea level rise seems to me to be the most consequential thing. And, and, and so, I, again, I kind of always ask the question, even if we stuck to the Paris Climate Accords, you know, how, how much sea level rise could we reasonably prevent? I, I, I wish, I wish that kind of answer was, was given to people with more context more, more often. Cause I, I mean, I'd like to know that answer. Yes. And, and the, the honest answer is I've actually done that calculation a long time ago and I can't remember the answer, but it's a fraction of an inch by the end of the century. Uh, and so yeah. what that tells you again is this is not the way to actually help people. Now, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do smart things to fix some parts of climate change, just like we shouldn't have you know, uh, 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 210 miles an hour speed limit. But right. the whole idea here is to say, you shouldn't try to go for three miles an hour. You shouldn't try to do the whole thing because you're gonna be insanely expensive way to achieve fairly little, even in a hundred years. That's why we need to get the balance right. Uh, and of course, if you actually want to help people with flooding or as you talked about wildfire or any of the other many, many problems, there are so many other much easier ways. One obvious way in the U.S. is to stop subsidizing people. Of, of, uh, they're typically subsidizing their uh, their insurance policies for settling in flood uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, flood zones. Yeah. You know, yeah. the, the fundamental point is it's too cheap to just build your house, get it flooded, build it again. No, there are places you don't build. 
And, and and so what you need to do is to have much better building regulations. You need to have some places where rivers can flood. Uh, that's why they're called flood zones. And you need to be able to, so Holland has been doing a lot of this. Obviously they've lived with water for, for hundreds of years. And, and mm -hmm. one of the things they've done is they've said, look, the Rhine has to go somewhere, this big river Rhine, it has to go somewhere. So some places we make it into parks and, and, and farms, but we also tell the farmer, sometimes this is gonna get flooded. The benefit is then other places don't get, uh, don't get flooded. You can manage these things if you do them smartly and if you do them realistically. But when people get up and say, ah, you know, these floods show we need to do the Paris Agreement, they're essentially saying the Paris Agreement will still allow the, uh, the climate to increase in heat and see more flooding. What it'll do is it'll slightly re reduce the increased flooding. So they're basically saying, we should reduce the increased flooding in 100 years. Tiny benefit of a negative instead of actually fixing the problem now. Why would we not want to first fix the problem cheaper, more effectively, and much, much faster? Right. And, and it also gets to a moral question of, of keeping developing countries back. Um, you have a lot of good examples about um, you know, well-intentioned environmentalists building solar panels in sub-Saharan Africa. And, you know, so, so what does this environmental justice do for them? Are they, mm -hmm. <laughs> does, this, does this work for developing nations and does this actually help climate change? Well, so there's a lot of pressure on, uh, on the whole world to cut uh, carbon emissions. And, and the simple reason is if only the rich world cuts carbon emissions, it'll have virtually no impact. Uh, just to give you one statistic, and again, this is run by on the UN climate model, the central UN climate model. If the whole rich world, so OECD, so the US, Europe, uh, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, Canada, a few others, if they all shut down their economies tomorrow, emitted no CO2 for the rest of the century, the impact by the end of the century would be a reduction in temperatures of 0 0.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, it would be a tiny part. And that's, of course, because most of the emissions of the 21st century will come from the right now, relatively poor countries who want to develop, who wants to have the same opportunities as we've had. One of the wonderful things of cheap and readily accessible energy is that you can do a lot more things. You can stop being poor. You can keep your, uh, your foods uh, refrigerated. You can actually get to places. You can develop. This is what we've done. And of course, they want to do the same thing. So when you go down to the developing countries and often tell them, I'm sorry, you've got to switch to uh, uh, renewable energy. It makes people in the rich world feel really good, but mostly it's a way to tell the poor world, I'm sorry, you got to stay in poverty. Giving people a solar panel is not bad. I mean, it actually means you can recharge your cell phone, you can have a lamp on uh, during the night. And if you didn't have that before, that's wonderful. But it's not very much because you actually need a lot more power in order to drive your agriculture, to drive your industry, and to pull you out of poverty. And telling people you can't have those coal-fired power plants because we worry about global warming is essentially telling them you won't be able to have nearly the same development. So uh, as, as you mentioned in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, there's been several studies that show uh, that while people are happy about getting a solar panel, especially if it's free, they're not actually willing to pay for the full price for it. But if they get it, they're, they're happy about that. But most of them, uh, so about 90% still want access to grid power because that's how you actually get rich. Uh, and likewise, when the U.S. has been, uh, so under Obama, the U.S. was uh, was trying to go uh, for uh, electrifying, get a lot more energy to Africa, which is really wonderful. But they decided they were only going to do that with renewables. Uh, one calculation showed that for every one person you gave electricity with renewables, had you focused on gas power instead, you could have given four people the same amount of energy. Why would you choose to not help the three, why would you leave them in poverty just simply because you're worried about global warming? Yeah, I mean, it's a very frustrating conversation because I, you know, um, I just visited the Permian Basin, um, uh, you know, out in, in Midland, Texas, and mm. it's where the shale revolution happens, of course. 
And if we were just exporting natural gas all over the world, American natural gas, which um, according to EPA studies, you know, on a lifetime basis burns 42% cleaner than Russian natural gas, gave it to places like Africa and helped them industrialize, it, you know, industrialized nations become cleaner. Uh, it's yeah. counterintuitive to people, but they just do. Because again, there's, there's other environmental questions besides uh, CO2 emissions. There's, is your waste going into a river that flows into the ocean? Is all your plastic waste going into the ocean? I mean, 95% of the world's plastics in the Pacific Ocean come from, what, what is it, like 10 rivers in Asia? You know, and everybody mm -hmm. in America thinks it's their straws. It's not. <laughs> it's, yeah. you know, because we, because we have a trash system. Like, you know, we, we have a trash collection system. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I always ask somebody that, where do you think your straw is going if you throw it away? And they're like, I don't know, the ocean, a turtle's nose. And it's like, it's not, yeah. it's not. Um, you, you're not, as long as you're not a jerk and throwing it into a storm drain, uh, it's, it's going to a, a waste dump and it's, it's treated correctly because we're an industrialized nation and we got there with, with reliable energy and natural gas is a it's pretty clean energy. It's, it's, it's reduced, uh, emissions in the U S by enormous amounts. I think, um, I, I don't want to misspeak. Are we at like 1987 levels of CO2 emissions in the U S I, I heard that recently. That I don't want to yeah, be, that sounds about right. be yeah. quoted on it, but you know, it's, there's, there's things that work and there's, and there's things that simply don't work. Um, yeah. you know, recently, and recently it, New York, go ahead. Dan, if I can just, uh, you know, so actually, uh, again, the, the whole plastic things is a very first world, uh, conversation because obviously when you ask developing country people, um, generally poor, uh, people's, uh, environmental uh, concerns, those are outdoor and indoor air pollution. Uh, those are about the fact that they don't have access to clean drinking water and sanitation. Those are the simple things that kill many millions of people. And as you quite rightly mentioned, uh, indoor air pollution is a very surprising thing. It used to be the biggest environmental killer in the world. And one of the reasons why it gone down dramatically is because most people have gotten richer, especially in China. Uh, so this is the fact that you cook and keep warm with dirty fuels like dung and cardboard and uh, you know, wood, whatever you can find. And, and you basically burn that inside, your home becomes like 10 times more polluted on average than Beijing when it's worst. So the, the point is about two to three billion people live in terrible conditions with enormous air pollution. And, and they're rightly, I think, somewhat surprised that the rich people are walking around and worrying about global warming, right? basically worrying about uh, temperature rises in a hundred years, instead of the fact that their kids are coughing right now and will likely die prematurely, both from indoor air pollution and outdoor air pollution. So again, there are many other environmental problems than most poor countries will want to fix first because they're much more important for them and their kids. And then of course they have lots and lots of other problems like you know, uh, uh, tuberculosis and malaria and, and lots of other diseases and lack of food and lack of good education and all these other issues that we also need to recognize actually makes up a great life. Right, and it's a, it's a matter of where do you invest and, and where's the biggest benefit for, for, for that investment. Um, yeah. you, you, you're, in your book, you point out um, a couple other interesting facts slash studies um, where we're sort of trying to do the right thing actually um, creates more CO2 emissions or, or more pollutions. Um, you know, trying to make good choices falls into a rebound effect. So you point out a 2018 Norwegian study on the families who tried to cut their food waste spent their savings on other goods that emit so much CO2 that the original emission savings was, was entirely canceled. Um, yeah, because you know, it's a feel good versus do good kind of um, uh, dichotomy, I guess. And yeah. me meat eating is another another one. Um, yeah, so Dan, like I'm 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 a vegetarian. You know, I I I I think people should go vegetarian, or at least I love the fact that they do. So I get more choice at the restaurant. Uh, but the <laughs> argument that not in Texas, okay, not in the best no, barbecue no, in the world. No opportunity, <laughs> no opportunity in Texas. All right, no. Uh, but but uh, but the idea that it's being sold as this wonderful way to cut carbon emissions, and people will bandy around and say you'll cut half of your emissions. Of course, what's rarely point out is your food emissions which is only a small part of your total emissions. Uh, so the actual number is more likely to be about 4% of your emissions that you will cut if you go vegetarian. But because going vegetarian is also cheaper, you have more money left over. And just like you mentioned with the, uh, with the food, food waste study, turns out you spend this on other things, you emit more CO2 through those uh, uh, spendings, 
And the net impact is you only cut your emissions about 2%. If you were to pay for someone else to cut this, you could actually pay $1.50 and you could cut the same amount of CO2 in the world uh, through one of the uh, regional uh, uh, trading systems in the US. So the fundamental point here is, yeah, it's not that it does nothing, but it's very close to nothing. Yeah. Um, can you explain that? Excuse me, you, you use that example of like what you could purchase CO2 offsets for $1.50 a year. You also use the same um, kind of analysis for electric cars, um, you know, based on what it takes to produce them, um, mm. what they actually reduce in emissions. Um, they actually increase emissions if, if, a, if a place where you're recharging them uses coal generated power. Um, you know, the, and, and so you say that each car saves eight tons of CO2 over its lifetime, but you could offset that for $48 a year. Um, no, you know, no, there's other, total, total. yeah. It's, so, it's so what do you mean? How do you, how do you offset that? That's the, well, go, go ahead. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, there are several, uh, trading systems around the world. Uh, I use the Reggie, which is the oldest, uh, us, uh, uh, in the Northeast. Uh, a number of States have gone together and decided that power plants can only emit so much CO2. So they actually have to buy trading rights to, uh, emit CO2, just like you did with acid rain back in the eighties. Uh, and yeah. it's a, a economically very efficient way to cut carbon emissions because you don't tell people how to cut your emissions. You simply say you can only emit this much. And as, uh, if, if you want to emit more, you have to buy these certificates. That means you're buying them from the ones who can cut it at the lowest cost. So what the cost of cutting a ton of CO2 right now in the Northeast is it's about $6 per ton. And that means you could basically pay $48. You used to be able to do this physically. You can't actually do this anymore uh, because it was just too low. Uh, there was too few people doing this. But in principle, you could buy the offset of, uh, of uh, eight tons. That means make sure that other emitters, you know, power plants would switch a little bit more away from coal and towards gas to reduce those eight tons of CO2. And then you would basically have made that happen by paying them $48. So the idea is it's a great way to see our, our incentives aligned. And they're not. Remember in the US mostly, I don't know what it's like in Texas, but uh, you know the, the federal uh, subsidy to an electric car is $7,500. Uh, there's lots of local regulations. So you also in, in California, you get extra money. You also get to use the high occupancy lane. You get free parking, you get free electricity, lots and lots of other things. Yeah, so mm -hmm. at least you give away about $10,000. But the benefit, you could have gotten the same benefit for $48, and certainly yeah. states could have bought that for $48. There's something wrong about spending $10,000 to achieve a benefit that you could have achieved for $48. You could have done so much more good, and we can actually calculate how much more good, right? You could have done, what is that, two, is it 200, 2,000 uh, times more good? You know, so 48 yeah. divided by 10,000. That's a lot more you could have done if you'd cared. But unfortunately, we often, just don't care all that much because as you say, it's more about feeling good than doing good. Yeah, this entire, the entire movement has become sort of a virtue signaling movement. It's become very religious. Like you have to believe this and, and the believe is, is the operative word there. It's not that you know that this works because obviously when you calculate these things as you have, it, it clearly doesn't, it's clearly debunked, but there's a belief that this is the right thing to do. And it makes people feel good. And, you know, even, even yeah. with that $10,000 subsidy, that that's still, that's still just for the rich. I mean, electric cars are not cheap. Um, no. you know, Teslas are really cool. I kind of want one, can't really afford one, but they are, they are cool. Um, oh, yeah. you know, uh, but, but the, yes, yeah, I mean, but what's the benefit? Uh, uh, what what is it? Uh, I think it's 90% of all, uh, uh, subsidies for electric cars that go to the, uh, top, uh, 25% in the U S. Uh, so absolutely, of course, you know, poor people are basically just subsidizing this uh, and, and they do that in a lot of different ways. Uh, so they also subsidize the, the subsidies to uh, solar panels because it's rich people putting up solar panels, not poor people and on and on. Uh, and so, again, yes, it is very much a sense of saying I am doing good to save the world. And, and that's what I, I think that's wonderful that people really do want to help the world. But then I constantly ask. Well, 
couldn't you have done more good if you had focused here, here, and here? And if you start engaging that conversation, at least you can get some way to getting people to realize maybe there are other things where we should be spending more resources first because we'll actually end up helping the world so much more. Right, and, and we can look to the EU, Germany specifically, for um, some guidance on this as they move to renewables. You point out that most of the re renewables they're talking about are biomass, so they're burning hmm. trees. Can, can you talk they're, about that? They're burning. They're they're burning American trees, mind you. Uh, so we're importing a lot of the wood from America. Uh, people believe that most uh, energy, uh, most renewable energy from uh, uh, in 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 the European Union or indeed in the U.S. is uh, solar and wind. It's not. Uh, mostly it is in the US, it is uh, 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 hydro, and in Europe, it's wood. It's the oldest energy form uh, available. Why? Well, partly because unlike solar and wind, you can actually burn wood when you need it. So it's a dispatchable uh, energy, just like you know uh, the fossil fuels. And it makes much more sense if you actually want to integrate it. So two thirds of all renewables uh, from, from uh, uh, is, is, uh, is biomass and only one third is solar and wind in the EU. The second thing to remember is- But does, does wood, that even reduce burn? emissions? I mean, when, when you're bur yeah. burning wood, I mean, so wood stores CO2, that's what trees yeah. do. When you burn it, it releases it. So yep. is that even a good, how is that even renewable? There, there, there's well, a I guess lot technically because you can, because you can grow it, I suppose. So it's yeah. renewable, but like, it's, that's not good for so, the environment. So the argument, when you burn it, it actually emits more CO2 than coal. Uh, so what it's the, the most polluting. <laughs> plus, of course, it also emits lots of other uh, damaging particulates, which right. are actually much more danger dangerous. The argument in the EU in many places, and I believe many places in the US as well, is that it actually means you'll plant a new tree for where you cut down this tree. So over the next 80 years, you will have you will have soaked up that extra CO2. So over an 80 year time frame, it is CO2 neutral. That is at best it's a very tenuous argument. That's not, that can't be true, right? Well, I mean, it just I mean, would, I mean, a good argument would be, hey, let's cut them down and build things out of wood because then you're not releasing the CO2. Yes. That would yes, make but sense. But of course, you, you, you couldn't build all that much. And that's why people are then saying, well, maybe we should just cut them down and store it underground and then you know plant new trees. And this is the kind of way that happens once you start focusing on CO2 as the only variable that matters for the world. But of course, mm -hmm. this is, a, 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 in many ways, a very expensive way of spending lots of society's resources and forgetting all the other things we need to do. Uh, I, I think it's it's instructive to look uh, back just a couple of years ago on the World Health Organization. They were you know, telling us uh, over and again that the world's biggest health problem was global warming. Uh, if you look at the World Economic Forum that met in Davos this January, which feels like a million years ago, uh, they met, uh, they, the high and mighty from around the world met, and they all agreed that all the major challenges facing the world was environmental, mostly global warming. You know, this was while the pandemic was spreading from China. Uh, and so in some sense, it shows you what happens when you only focus on one issue, namely climate change, you end up forgetting that there are lots of other issues we need to tackle. And there are lots of other problems that at least warrant as much attention as global warming. And many of these where we can spend a dollar and end up helping so much more uh, instead of what we're doing with climate, where we're spending lots of dollars and doing almost no good. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, let me list those things because uh, I think we have a, have a picture from your book here. Uh, about 9.7 million people across the world were, uh, were surveyed and told mm -hmm. to rank their priorities out of 16 options. And so uh, this is what they came up with. Number one, education. Two, health. Three, jobs. Four, corruption. Nutrition. Violence. Clean water and sanitation support for people who can't work, better infrastructure, equality, reliable energy, political freedom, no discrimination, protecting forests, rivers, and oceans, phone and internet, and last is action on climate change. Hmm. So that's, kind of, that's yeah. an interesting 
And, <laughs> and this was, you, you, you remember you asked me what, what that book was, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Those are actually the ones that the UN set for, for 2016, 2030. Uh, and, and, and this survey was part of that. They wanted to ask people, what do you want to focus on? And people, not surprisingly, told them, I don't want my kids dying from easily curable infectious diseases. I want them to have a good education. I want them to have food. You know, it was very simple things that most people around the world want. And they place climate change last, not because they say it doesn't matter at all, but it simply matters relatively much less than most other issues. This outcome basically got relegated to the back end of one web page, and the UN has never talked about it because it gave the wrong answer. Uh, and, and, and it's an interesting point to realize that, look, for most people around the world, there are many other things that matter a lot more. And on top of that, it turns out that most of these things we can also fix much, much cheaper. And this, of course, is one of the reasons why we really need to say, sure, let's fix part of global warming smartly, but let's also realize there are many other problems that we need to fix. Yeah. Uh, another thing, you have a graph in your book. Um, this is to note. So if, it, and this is, you I know, mean, this is all taken from the UN, you know, so this is, we're just, like you said, we're accepting the premise and accepting all of the, all of the data here. If you follow the fossil fuel pathway, we'll hit an average welfare of $79,000 per person. This is after deducting for climate change charges in 2076. If we follow the green pathway, I'm not sure how that's defined. Maybe you can enlighten us. Um, we won't hit that level until 2100. So choosing the green pathway means we're literally holding the world back by an entire generation. So by the end of the century, the difference for the entire world population is $509 trillion per year. Um, that means a lot for people's personal lives and all of those priorities that they lay, they lay out. So what, what I'm what I'm talking about here is uh, the UN uh, because they need to look at what will happen with uh, uh, the temperature of the century. They have made five scenarios of what the likely development in the world is going to look like. I uh, you know they have sort of a central estimate and and that basically shows we're all going to be much much richer towards the end of the uh, of the century. If we're not going to be a lot richer global warming won't be much of a problem because we won't be emitting very much, and especially people in the developing world won't be emitting very much. So overall, this is obviously a great outcome. I'm discussing the two very best outcomes. One is a green scenario, so a sustainable scenario, the one that I think uh, you know 95% of all pundits would choose in a blink of an eye. Uh, that sounds nice and wonderful. We should do that. We should get on that path. They also have another path that's called the fossil fuel pathway. Uh, and, and of course, that sounds nasty and, and dark and, uh, uh, and polluted and everything. And it will have higher temperatures, but it will also have phenomenally higher productivity because we have kept all the fossil fuels and we've actually kept the world running really, really well. So what you have to look at is how much better will we be off in that scenario and how much more of global warming will be a problem? It turns out that when you look at those two things and deduct the damage, uh, the extra damage done from global warming, each person in the world will be about $60,000 richer per person per year in today's dollars by 2100 if we choose the fossil fuel a pathway over the green scenario. Now, remember, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to fix some of both of these. So we should go yeah. for all the be benefits that come from a world that's mostly focused on economic growth, because that's how you pull people out of poverty. That's how you give people opportunity around the world. Of course, if we get richer, we'll also be better able to handle climate change and we'll be better able to invest in the solutions that are needed to actually make it less of a problem. But it's ridiculous that we would forego, as you mentioned, $500 trillion in net worth for the world every year, just simply because we're scared of global warming. Right. And, you know, it took a while, it took a while to, to get us to this point, but, you know, now we have to talk solutions, but we spent a lot of time talking about the premise, what's true and what isn't. And I think that's very important when we frame the discussion on, you know, rational environmentalism. So now we have to talk about, because we would like the best of both worlds. We, we would like our cake and we would like to eat it too. Uh, we would like the benefits of reliable energy and developments. And we would also like to reduce carbon emissions, um, you know, at, because that seems like a good idea. 
uh, given mm. given temperatures rising and um, the costs that they 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 may impose. So so talk about solutions that that work and don't work. Okay, so yeah. we we've, we've got a long list of options here. We've got let's say carbon capture. We've got nuclear. We've got wind and solar. We've got hydro. You know what in 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 your estimation, in your research is is our best bet at again having the best of both worlds. So uh, I would love to be able to tell you exactly what technology that is, but that's exactly the point of of the book, and I think most uh, of the economic research around this. We don't know what is going to power the rest of the twenty first century, but we know how to fix climate change, namely through innovation. So fundamentally, you know, look at most big problems in the world. How do we fix those problems? We didn't fix them by telling people, I'm sorry, could you do with a little less? Could you, you know, hold back? We fixed it through technology. So, you know, take, for instance, Los Angeles in the 1950s. It was terribly polluted, uh, mostly from cars. Uh, and, and sort of the standard environmental approach would be to say, I'm sorry, you got to drive less or maybe, you know, just scrap uh, the car. Uh, and of course, that would have had no success whatsoever. But in 1974, we invented the catalytic converter. And that's this beautiful little machine that basically means you can drive just as much, but it pollute a lot, lot less. And that's one of the reasons why uh, Los Angeles air is now much cleaner than it used to be. So the idea that technology is the thing that can both allow us to have our cake and to eat it. And that's, of course, what we need to do with climate change. So look, there are lots and lots of good ideas out there. The common denominator for all of these great ideas for, for fixing climate change is they're not cost effective right now. If they were cost effective, everyone would just be buying them. Uh, so, you know, people love to say that solar and wind is cheaper than fossil fuels, which is often true when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing, but when it's not. They're not because you you get zero out of them and you basically yeah. need the whole backup power opportunity, which often is a huge extra cost. Or you need batteries. Uh, and and you know, just to give you a sense of scale, right now, the U.S. has batteries enough to store 14 seconds of average U.S. electricity consumption. So we need a totally different size, size of scale if we're actually going to store uh, not only uh, uh, over overnight, uh, even you know a few weeks of doldrums and, and wind, but possibly even over uh, seasons. So the idea here yeah. is to recognize we should be investing a lot more in innovating green new ideas. This could be just get cheaper batteries. There's a lot of good reasons why that would be a good idea, both because it would uh, help us uh, make uh, solar and wind cheaper, but also it would get you a better cell phone battery. And you know there'd be lots of other benefits to this. Likewise, there are many other ideas. So one of my favorite ideas is Craig Vender. If you remember him, he, he was the guy who cracked the human genome back in 2000. Um, mm -hmm. He has this idea of of having uh, uh, growing algae out on the ocean surface. These algae will uh, soak up sunlight and CO2 and produce oil. So basically we could produce oil on the ocean surface and it would be CO2 neutral because it would just have been produced with CO2, you know, the same season. We'd take it in, mm -hmm. we'd put it in our fossil fuel economy and it would be CO2 neutral. If this could work, it would be a fantastic solution for everything. Now, possibly not for existing oil producers, but the fundamental point is it would be an incredibly cheap way for us to get lots of energy and actually not have to retool our entire economy. Doesn't work right now. All right, it works, but it's incredibly expensive. But his argument is, give me some more research money and maybe I can find a way to make this cheap enough. The idea is we have tens of thousands of these ideas. Most of them are gonna fail and that's fine because we really just need a few of these to come through. And then we can get not just rich, well-meaning Americans to cut their carbon emissions and switch to expensive solar and wind, but we can get everyone to switch to this new, cheaper technology or bundle of technologies that'll enable everyone to be both better off and actually cut carbon emissions. So this is by far the best in single intervention that we can do. Yeah, and it seems to me that nuclear is a pretty obvious option. Reliable energy lasts a long time. Um, you know, you could you could enrich the uranium at a higher level and make it even more efficient. I had a, mm -hmm. uh, Michael Schellenberger on my podcast um, a couple of weeks ago. I don't even think we've released the episode yet, but it's going to be a good one. 
Um, yes. And, and, uh, and look, there, there's two things to say about nuclear. One is to recognize, uh, well, actually three. Uh, first, it's much, much safer than most other uh, energy technologies, very counter to what most people believe. Uh, so, you know, you think of, of nuclear as terribly, terribly dangerous, but if you actually do the math, it has killed very, very few people. And remember, almost all energy forms kill people, and certainly coal fire power kill lots of people. But the second thing is to remember, if you're really worried about global warming, nuclear is the only way to cut carbon emissions dramatically in the short run. That's, you know, France has shown that very clearly. And we know that it's the way to both get uh, 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 baseload power and to get baseload power that is very close to CO2 neutral. The right. problem with nuclear, and that's my third point, is that right now building new nuclear, uh, uh, new, new nuclear turns out to be fairly expensive. Yeah. Uh, this is for a wide range of reasons, and 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 Schellenberger will tell you, and I think that's probably true, that much of this is simply because we have over-regulated uh, nuclear. Uh, but, but I just don't see anyone being able to successfully argue, let's make nuclear a little less safe, and then it'll be a lot cheaper. So, you know, the fundamental pro problem is right now nuclear is just, you know, two to three times more costly than fossil fuels. So just like solar and wind, you're not going to convince most people to switch right now. But again, Bill Gates and many others are arguing, let's invest in fourth generation nuclear that's going to be much cheaper, much safer, much more modularized. It's something that we could you know, basically power the whole world. I would love that to happen. And we should invest in that as one of the opportunities. The only reservation I have is that was also what they told us about the first three generations of nuclear power. Right? So, so again, let's certainly look at this as one of the many solutions, but let's not put all our eggs in that one basket because at the end of the day, this is really not about which particular technology we end up with, but that we end up with a technology that's safe, yeah. that emits very little CO2 and is cheap. Yeah, and it, you know, there's there's bills in the U.S. Congress to to make nuclear more palatable. Um, you know, because I'm very skeptical of even the notion that wind and solar are somehow cheaper than fossil fuels. I I think the 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 reasoning or the analysis that goes into that statement is a little bit flawed. It doesn't mm. take into account the extra transmission lines that you have to build. It doesn't take into account um, a, a, quite a few things, and there's it's subsidized mm. heavily too. Everybody yeah. seems to think that the oil and gas industry is subsidized. It's it's not. That's a, it's a myth. It's a very strange myth that I don't know how that everybody believes. I mean, they're subsidized only in the sense that that they, they get the same tax credits that every other business gets for, say, you know, exploration, research, and development, things like that. Uh, but it's not subsidized directly the way solar and wind are, and and they get mm. tax credits. Um, yeah. it, it's strange that those tax credits aren't aren't technology neutral. This is another bill in, in Congress that we should just pass. I don't know why we wouldn't, mm. but it says like, you know, these, these tax credits should be technology neutral. Any technology that reduces emissions uh, or, is re or is emission free, like nuclear should get the same tax credits. That, that, that seems obvious. And then, you know, in the battery storage, I mean, you mentioned 14 seconds of average US electricity usage. That's it's all the batteries and battery technology can only can can only advance so much, right? There's only so much energy density in it, in lithium and anything, right? I mean, so I think mm -hmm. there's a theoretical limit to that that would just, you know, you see, oh, in, sure. yeah, and in, in, I don't know, I'm off the top of my head, but it's 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 pretty when, when you start to visualize how much how large a battery farm would have to be to even provide four hours of energy, it's enormous. And then how, all the mm. mining that has to occur to get all of the lithium to use, it's, it's, it becomes astronomical and you start to scratch your head and wonder, why are we even pursuing this very strange path uh, mm. when, there's, when there's more cost, uh, the more beneficial paths um, before so, us? So again, I, I, I think the, the, the main answer is, as, as you rightly point out, a lot of people will tell you solar and wind is competitive. Uh, and then right after they'll say, we, though, still need to keep the uh, subsidies in place because otherwise people won't invest in it, which of course gives away the game. Uh, it's, it is mostly competitive when the sun is shining or mm -hmm. when the wind is uh, blowing. And what most of these uh, wind and solar power plants do is they go in in industrial countries where you already have a wide range of, of, uh, of, uh, of baseload power and they suck out part of the benefit of those 
power plants because they've already been invested in. Uh, and, and so when you can just get to sell your wind, whenever the wind blows, obviously that's great, but it doesn't help you power the whole system. And that's really the problem that you can do some part of it, but it's at a fairly high cost. And if you want to go further, which is what you know, Germany and many others, and right now California is also showing us, you get into lots of problems. Now, you could potentially do more with with batteries. So, uh, you know, one study from the International Energy Agency shows that uh, we expect that batteries will become cheaper. If they become a lot cheaper, it turns out that instead of India building more coal fired power plants after 2030, it turns out that they will not build more simply because they can close the extra gap with extra solar panels and batteries. So again, I think the whole point here is we shouldn't think in this uh, zero one solution, just like we talked about at the beginning, this is not a, a, either the whole world is uh, you know, solar and wind or nothing is. It, solar and wind will have part of the solution. And certainly with batteries, there will be a greater pa part of this, but it's likely not going to be the whole thing and certainly not before it's become vastly cheaper. And so again, what we need to do is to invest in research and development because research is cheap and you can get dramatic benefits. But do not, do not put up lots of inefficient solar panels or wind turbines right now because that's just sucking out uh, taxpayer money and delivering very little CO2 reduction. Yeah, and the conservationists are really starting to wake up to the solar and wind issue um, because it, it, it yes. takes vast amounts of land, kills way more wildlife than, than I think was previously reported. Um, especially by the by the wind companies, and, uh, and and again it causes rolling blackouts. I mean, California is dealing with that now um, mm. because their their grid is so screwed up and expensive. Um, yep. And in Texas, we're, we, we've we've seen similar problems, not to the same extent. We we have our own electric grid in in Texas, and you know there's there's been some some because of some of the problems it's had. Some have said, oh, we need to integrate into the rest of the U.S. But is that really? Be but we also have the most wind turbines in the US. Um, so, I mean, could that be part of it too? And it's just inefficient use of energy. Hmm. So, so I, again, I don't know about Texas, but certainly the idea of saying that you want to get- I thought everybody knew high everything high. about Texas because it's the greatest <laughs> place in the world. Well, I've heard that said, yes, uh, but 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 the reality is that that uh, when when you want to get to about a hundred percent renewables, you actually have to have like three hundred percent wind and two hundred percent solar and so on. Uh, because what are you going to do uh, when the sun is not there? When wind is not there, you need to have huge banks of of, of battery to uh, to uh, power it up. So as we we started talking about if you had all the money in the world, sure, you can do it. But in any realistic sense, what you need to do is to recognize you are not going to be able to afford this. That's what California and Germany is showing you. But certainly most of the rest of the world is not even going to contemplate this unless yeah. U.S. ingenuity makes these cheaper options. So if we can find this technology that will undercut the, uh, the cost of fossil fuels, we're done. Everyone will switch, not because we, you know, we need to twist their arms at uh, an other Paris Agreement uh, uh, event, but simply because it's cheaper. What about, um, yeah, and I agree with that. I mean, one of, one of my bills is simply uh, investing in research and development for carbon capture as it relates to natural gas. It's, it's a proven technology. We've got a plant right outside of Houston that does it. You know, the question mm -hmm. is scalability and, and you know, what kind of, a, we don't need that much more investment to, to scale that out to, to a larger extent. So you have reliable natural gas. Um, I mean, this one plant, it's amazing. It, it takes in natural gas, creates electricity, somehow sucks back in the CO2 emissions and powers the plant with that. So it's a net wow. zero emissions. You know, it's on a small scale. I think it powers like 5,000 homes, but mm. um, it's incredible. And, and the, 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 the amount of land that it takes up too, I think is an important thing, which is again, which is why conservationists have started to, to get, become more anti-wind and solar because just the, you know, the mass amounts of land required for wind and solar yeah. versus a nuclear plant versus a natural gas plant. You know, they're talking about getting rid of a, of a nuclear plant up in New York right now and replacing it with renewables. I mean, this is, it's, it's very hard to see the benefits in doing something like that. Um, yes. And, and of well, course, in reality, it's mostly going to get replaced by fossil fuels. Right. Which they like to import in the Northeast. They like to import the natural gas from Russia, yeah. which is 
a very strange because they hate because they hate pipelines so much they can't possibly take right, u.s natural right. gas in a pipeline because pipelines make them feel gross like that and that's it that's 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 the reasoning i mean i, I there, there's no better reasoning really um so one, one one other thing you talk about is geoengineering that's that's an interesting branch of science so d describe what maybe we could expect from from geoengineering so one of the things that you worry about with global warming is that temperatures are going to rise and that's going to be all other things a net negative what if you could actually adjust the thermostat on the planet uh we know that's possible because uh when volcanoes erupt they emit a lot of uh, sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere, so the upper edge of the uh, atmosphere, and put a fine sort of sunshade on the planet and actually cools the planet. So uh, last time that happened was in 1991 in Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines. It reduced temperatures about a degree Fahrenheit around the world for a couple of years. Hmm. So people are saying, what if we did that artificially? So basically emulating a natural process. There are other ways that you could probably do this that would be less problematic and also cheaper. Uh, we, we estimate that probably one of the cheapest ways would be to whiten uh, marine clouds. So if you make clouds slightly whiter and you do that by, uh, they mostly crystallize around uh, or nuclearize around small sea salt particulates. If you put up more sea salt particulates in the, in the first couple hundred yards of the atmosphere, it will actually make these clouds slightly whiter. We know that because it already happens where, uh, where uh, ships are going. Uh, but if we could do that more generally, we could make the planet a little whiter, reflect more sunlight, make the world cooler. Now, nobody is suggesting we should do this right now, but you should certainly investigate it for two reasons. Partly because it gives us a good backup plan. If something really goes wrong with climate change, we know that no realistic climate policy can actually do anything about it. You know, the Paris Agreement or anything else, it'll take uh, at least half a century to really have it, an impact. Whereas geoengineering could basically do something in a couple of weeks or maybe even in a day. So you could dramatically lower temperatures if you really need it to. The second reason is because it's so cheap, it's likely that over the century, you know, some billionaire or maybe, maybe even just a, a very motivated NGO will do something like the, along those lines. So we should certainly find out if overall this is going to be a good thing. Just to give you a sense of proportion, we estimate that you could avoid all of global warming temperature impacts. That's not all of the warming impacts, but sorry, not all of the climate change impacts, but most of them for $9 billion in total. Remember, that's you know sort of a thousand to 10,000 times cheaper than anything else that we're talking about with global warming. So we should certainly look at this. We shouldn't do it right now because we don't know whether there's you know bad things lurking out there, uh, but we certainly want to investigate whether this would be a good idea. Yeah, I mean it's it's fascinating. I mean we've, you know, we we surprise ourselves as a human race um, every couple of decades with what we figure out, mm. and um, you know it, it seems like that would that's something we should consider pursuing, um, at least investigating. As you know, um, is there anything else promising that that you've come across? Well, so the last point that I make on on what we we should be doing is prosperity. Uh, and, and that comes as a surprise to a lot of people because you think, you know, we should you know, cut carbon emissions, we should have innovation, ad adapt, do geoengineering, all these things. How is prosperity a good way forward? But the reality, of course, is to recognize that for most people, especially the world's poorest people, when you worry about the fact, and we often do that, you know, a new hurricane hitting the Philippines and it's terrible and people will say we should cut carbon emissions to help these people. Or when you worry about heat waves uh, coming in over these people and you say we should cut carbon emissions, it's an incredibly ineffective way to help them. You know, there'll still be heat waves, there'll still be hurricanes, possibly slightly less bad, but our cutting carb carbon emissions is going to be fairly expensive and it'll help them a tiny bit in a hundred years. But if you actually want it to help them, if you got them to be more prosperous, that is, they, they could actually afford not to live under corrugated roofs, but actually in a good house, they would be much less vulnerable uh, to a hurricane. Uh, likewise, if we could get them air conditioning, instead of not having air conditioning, they'd be much less vulnerable to heat waves. 
Both of these things are just examples of saying, if you get more prosperous, you get much more resilient. So remember when a hurricane hits Florida, yeah, it creates a lot of damage, uh, but you know, fairly few people die and, and you're over it in a couple of months. But when the same sort of hurricane hits Guatemala, it'll devastate the country. Tens of thousands of people will die and the economy is uh, brought down for you know, years on end. And so the idea here is to recognize, even if you just care about climate change, making sure that people get more prosperous is one of the most effective ways to help people with climate. And of course, if you get prosperous, it's actually good for everything else. It means you can start feeding your kids and giving them a good education and avoiding them dying from easily curable infectious diseases and all these other things that also challenge most people around the world. Yeah. And as we pointed out multiple times, it just, it also makes the environment cleaner. Uh, yes. More industrialized countries become cleaner. That, that's just a fact. You know, they, they burn less wood. Um, there's there's less uh, in, indoor smoke uh, because they're not burning as much wood. You'd rather have natural gas heating a home instead of a, a wood fire. You're clearing less lands um, to, to for, for farming if you industrialize your farming and make it more efficient and add technology to that. To that, you know, it's there's, there's hmm. so many examples. Uh, you're, you're putting less pollution in rivers and oceans. I mean, that that drives me crazy because that's something we can see. You know, I think yeah. it drives everybody crazy when they see a river or an ocean polluted, and rightfully so. Um, but you know, we have to be honest about the the actual ways to fix that. Yeah. Um, oh, I've kept you for a long time here. Uh, great conversation, Jordan Lomberg. Thank you so much for uh, enlightening us on um, on all your research Man, and all your work. We really Dan, appreciate it. Was it. Great. It was great to talk to you. And uh, look, I uh, I really hope we can start having a smarter conversation about climate change and ultimately end up spending less resources doing it smarter and then, you know, fixing climate.